So crystalline solids have regular order, repeating order to their particles, atoms or molecules or ions. <coughs> and this pattern, this arrangement is called a crystalline lattice. Um, the particles are going to arrange themselves in a way that minimizes their energy. <coughs> And exactly how they arrange themselves is going to depend on their size um, and the, the rel if there's more than one type of particle, their relative sizes and their charges. And we'll talk more about that later, but now we're going to look at just the very basic organizational structure. So what we call the unit cell is, I need to change this. Um, I think this is supposed to be indivisible or non-divisible. It's, it's the smallest unit of a crystal that when you repeat it in three dimensions, in fact, I'm just going to get rid of, rid of that word altogether. It's the smallest unit that when you repeat it in three dimensions, you get the entire crystal lattice, the unit cell. So we often represent a lattice, something like this, where these points are lattice points uh, represented by the circles um, are standing in for like an atom, an ion, a molecule, a particle of some kind. This dark red square here is marking the unit cell for this particular lattice. And then there's lighter red squares so you can see that if you took this square and you repeated it here and repeated it there and repeated it here, kind of like tiles, laying tiles on a bathroom floor, that you would get this whole pattern. The whole pattern is just this square repeated over and over again. Does that make sense? So there are a lot of different unit cells, and of course what we were looking at was two-dimensional. Crystals are three-dimensional, and so the unit cells are also three-dimensional. Three -dimensional. There are um, a cubic unit cell, such as this one um, here, is the shape of a cube. The lengths of the edges are all equal to each other, and the angles are 90 degrees. That's a cubic unit cell. There are also a whole bunch of other types of unit cells that we're not going to look at, but we should know that they exist. So this tetragon one, um, the sides are not all the same length. Um, we've got orthorhombic. In this one, we have one end is a square, but this le length is different. In the orthorhombic, the three dimensions are all different, but we have 90 degree angles. Then there's rhombohedral, hexagonal, monoclinic, and triclinic. And those are going to be different in terms of their edge lengths and the angles. So just know that those exist. We're going to look at the cubic cells. Keep it simple. Um, we're going to look at several different unit cells. And the way the book illustrates them, um, it uses different colors. The colors are just meant to help us visualize all these circles. It's hard to represent three-dimensional things on a two-dimensional screen or in the book. But what we're looking at now is all of the atoms being the same. So the different colors don't mean that they're different elements. They're all the same. Um, we can talk about um, a coordination number and what that means is if you look at one atom how many other atoms is it in direct contact with that's the coordination number and that's important because those are the atoms that um, the atom we're looking at can interact with <coughs> we can also look at packing efficiency which, as it suggests, is how much of the volume of the entire cell is actually occupied by the atoms or molecules. If you have a high coordination number, you'll have a greater packing efficiency. So if you're packing fruit, 
bunch of spheres. You want to pack them into the box so that you have the most fruit in the box. You don't want a whole bunch of empty space, right? So you want higher packing efficiency. Putting spheres together is not possible to make it 100% because when you put spheres next to each other, there will be gaps. They just don't line up. So the packing efficiency is never 100%. So this is an over, overview of um, three cubic unit cells. And we'll talk about them in more detail, but this can be a useful reference. We've got the simple cubic, uh, the body-centered cubic, and the face-centered cubic. And we're looking at how many atoms are in a unit cell, illustration, coordination number, edge length in terms of R, so we can define the edge length in terms of the radius of the atoms, and we can also look at the packing efficiency. So let's look at the simple cubic unit cell. This cell has one atom at each corner. So here's the center of one atom at this corner, the center of another atom at this corner, and they touch along the edge. So if the radius of the atom is R, then the edge length is r plus r, 2r. So we call the edge length L, and the radius of the atom is r, and so we can say that L is equal to 2r. In this unit cell, each of these corners is one-eighth of an atom, right? This is one-eighth of an atom, one-eighth, one-eighth, one-eighth. So we have eight-eighths of atoms, right? So if you took these pieces and assembled them together, you'd have one atom. Does that make sense? So a cubic unit cell contains one atom, but it's divided up. And we draw it this way instead of just looking at that atom say, oh, well, why don't we just call this an atom by itself? Because that doesn't um, reflect its relationship to the atoms nearby. If we took this cube here and replicated it in three dimensions, we would have the overall structure. And that's what a unit cell is. Any questions yet? You, you can't get this one any smaller. You can't get it any simpler. It's the simplest, the smallest. You could look at larger cells that could be repeated, but those could be divided down. So these are all looking at the smallest. And so when we say like an atom, that's what we're talking about? Yeah, so this would contain one atom. Um, you, you can't divide this any smaller. Like if you... You said, well, I just want to look at one corner of this. Well, if you repeated that on itself, it wouldn't give you the overall structure. Yeah. So here are other ways of looking at this cell. So that's the picture we were just looking at. Here, we're looking at those eight atoms, but we're, we're showing the entire atom. Right? The cubic unit cell goes from the center of each of these atoms, the cube inside. Because this part over here is part of the neighboring unit cell. We can look at sort of an exploded version of this. So here we have those eight atoms. And we've pulled them apart a little bit so that we can see um, into the structure. And if we look at one on the corner and look at some of the atoms in the adjacent uh, unit cells, we see that this atom is in contact with six other atoms. So it's in contact with one this way, and one that way, and one that way. And then outside of its own unit cell, in the because it's part of the other unit cells neighboring, it's in contact with this one and that one and that one. Does that make sense? So the coordination number is six. We can calculate a packing efficiency and it's gonna be 52%. This is almost 
almost half of this is empty space. It's not very efficient. So how do you calculate packing efficiency? We'll do an example here where we're looking at it in two dimensions, just to make it a little simpler. So this illustration here is a two-dimensional version of that cubic unit cell, where if we go from the center of one atom to the next, we can make a little square here. This is the one we're looking at. If we look at what's, how many atoms are inside that white square, well, there's parts of four atoms, right? But how much of this atom is in there? One fourth, right? Oops. This is one fourth of that atom and one fourth of this atom and one fourth and one fourth. So that adds up to be one atom. That make sense? It's easier when we look at it in two dimensions. It's the same idea in three dimensions. So there is one atom. Here we're looking at area instead of volume. So this cell contains one atom. And we're going to say that the radius of the atom is equal to the variable r. Right? So from here to here, that's R, the radius from the center to the edge. So if we want to know how long the edge of the cube is, it's going to be R plus R, or 2R. Two, two so if we look at the cube, this edge length, L, is equal to 2 times the radius. Make sense? So the, pers the packing efficiency will be the area occupied by atoms divided by the area of the cell. It's the part divided by the whole and then times 100. That's going to give us the packing efficiency. It'll tell us what percentage of that is occupied by atoms. So we need the area that's occupied by atoms. Well, there's one atom, right? It has a radius of r. <coughs> Excuse me. A radius of r. What's the equation for the area of a circle? Anybody remember? Pi r squared. So the area of a circle is pi times r squared. And pi is that weird number, 3.14159, and it goes on and never repeats itself, right? So you do not use 3.14 as an abbreviation. You use the pi button on your calculator. So if you need to multiply by pi, you just hit the pi button, and it does a whole bunch of extra digits for you. So the area occupied by the atoms is pi r squared. So let's go down here. So well, there's not a really good abbreviation for that. Um, so the area occupied by the atoms is equal to pi r squared. What's the area of the cell itself? It's the, yeah, it's 2r times 2r. Um, the area of a square is equal to the length times the length, or the length squared. And so we've got 2r, that quantity squared. So we could also say, well, that's 4r squared. So the area, occup the area of the whole cell is 4r squared. We can calculate the packing efficiency without knowing the radius of the atom because the packing efficiency doesn't change. The sizes of the atoms, the size of the unit cell would change, 
but the packing efficiency remains the same. And then we'd have to multiply by 100. So the radius squared cancels out. We end up with pi over 4 times 100. So pi button on the calculator. Divided by 4 times 100. And my calculator's being dumb and it's showing me 25 pi. It's like, that's not what I want. So there's a mode thing. So 78.54%. Usually the packing efficiency are listed with uh, two significant figures. Any questions? A three-dimensional lattice the idea of calculating the packing efficiency is going to be similar, but you're going to have to look at volumes instead of areas, right? The second type of cubic unit cell is called a body-centered cubic unit cell. <clears throat> and so here we've got two different colors for our atoms, um, but they are atoms of the same element just so we can see what's going on. Otherwise, it just starts to look like a mass of purple. So we have one atom in the center of the cube and then an eighth of an atom at each corner. And this then is repeated in three dimensions. So here the atoms are not touching along the length um, because otherwise this wouldn't fit inside. So we can't look at very simply what the edge length is. It's more than two times the radius, but it's not a simple matter. Where we have the atoms touching is diagonally from one corner across to the opposite corner. And so this distance here is there's one R and two R and three R and four R. So it's four radii, right? And um, so we can make um, a right triangle here, and we can use the Pythagorean theorem. And I think most of you are probably not all that interested in it. And we, we come down to this relationship. I think it's good to look at the simple cell and understand what we were doing. For the rest of this, it's fine if you just say, oh yeah, I believe it. She knows what she's talking about. The book knows it's good enough. We don't need to be able to prove that at all. So the length of a side is four times the radius divided by the square root of three. <clears throat> different views. So here's the one we were just looking at. Um, here, instead of having one atom in this cell, we now have the equivalent of two atoms because we still have eight eighths of atoms. So that's one plus this one in the middle. So this unit cell has two atoms in it. If we show the intact atoms, we end up with this. Um, here in the white is the unit cell. And then if we explode this so that we could look at this one on the corner and see how many atoms is it in direct contact with? It's in contact with eight atoms now instead of six. And if we calculate the packing efficiency, we find that it's larger at 68%. So we can do some problems like this. Um, an atom has, has a radius of 100, <coughs> excuse me, 138 picometers and crystallizes in the body-centered cubic unit cell. 
What's the volume of the unit cell in cubic centimeters? So we're going to need this relationship down here. The length is equal to 4r over the square root of 3. So the length of the edge is equal to 4 times the radius of the atom divided by the square root of 3. And I'm using that because this tells me body-centered cubic unit cell. It's asking me, what's the volume of the unit cell? So my unit cell is cubic. And so we have L and L and L. The volume of it is the length times the length times the length. Right? So the volume is equal to L cubed. So the volume is equal to the length cubed, which is, and the length is 4r over the square root of 3. So we just need to take that term and cube it. Yes? Yeah, I'm, I don't expect you to remember that. I have a hard time remembering it because I don't use it very often. So we're, we're given the radius of the atom. Um, and sometimes they'll be tricky and they'll give you the diameter instead. And then you have to divide by two to get the radius. But here they're giving us the radius in picometers. They're asking for the volume in cubic centimeters. Personally, I think it's easier to convert the just the radius to centimeters first and then stick it in the equation otherwise you have to convert cubed units which you know can certainly be done but people tend to make a lot more mistakes doing that so let's convert this 138 picometers we're trying to get to centimeters both of those units have prefixes we have two units we have two prefixes we need to do this in two steps so the first step is our first unit, picometers, and then we're going to go to the base unit, the one without the prefix. So we're going to go to meters. The second step, we're going to go to the unit with the other prefix that we want. And this is what I would recommend for all metric unit conversions. If you have two prefixes, just do it in two steps. It doesn't take that much longer, and it's simple. You don't have to think as much. So down here, we're going to put picometers because we want that unit to cancel out. And down here, I'm going to put meters. This is a refresher on metric unit conversions. What does pico stand for? Negative 12. Yeah, so what I remember, nano sounds like 9, right? So nano is 10 to the minus 9. Pico is the next one down. And they go by orders of magnitude of 3. So pico stands for 10 to the minus 12. So down here, I have 1 picometer. In the numerator, I'm going to write 1. And instead of the abbreviation pico, I'm going to write what it stands for, which is times 10 to the minus 12. Over here, I'm converting between centimeters and meters. What does the prefix centi stand for? 10 to the negative 2. So one centimeter on top, one, and then instead of centi, I'm writing what it means, times 10 to the minus 2. And then I can do that with my calculator. So I got 138 times 1 EE negative 12 divided by 1 EE negative 2. And my calculator is showing me a bunch of zeros, 1, 4. Right? So I had 138 here. My calculator is showing me 1, 4. 
because it's, it's able to show it to me in decimal notation, but it can only show me two non-zero digits because it doesn't have enough space. So it's rounding it on me. So the best thing to do is to change the mode and put it in scientific notation. And then it shows me 1.38 times 10 to the minus 8 <coughs> centimeters. Any questions? Let me show you one um, kind of shortcut that works pretty well without a lot of thinking. So if I take this 138 picometers, instead of writing pico here, I can write what pico stands for, which is 10 to the minus 12. So 138 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. This part is the pico. Now I've got meters, and then I can convert to centimeters in one step. I'll get the same answer. There are other things you can do, but I don't recommend them because I see students mess them up a lot. Okay. So there's my R in terms of centimeters. So I'm going to plug that into my equation. So I didn't plan this out very well. We're going to take this through over to here. Volume is 4 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters divided by the square root of 3, and that whole thing is cubed. getting 1.06 times 10 to the minus 8. That doesn't seem quite right. Yeah, that's better. 3.24 times 10 to the minus 23 cubic centimeters. That's an extremely small number. But I'm expecting an extremely small number because this cell contains two atoms. It's got to be super, super small, right? Doing this math in your calculator, it's easy to screw up. The first time I punched it in, I screwed it up. Um, so you have to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And how you punch it in depends on the specific calculator you have. So if you need help talking to your calculator, please let me know, and I'll help you communicate. Any questions? third type of cubic unit cell is face centered. So here what we have is we, on the face of the cube, we have an atom that is centered. So the atom is centered on the face. The previous one, there was an atom centered in the middle, in the body. Here we have a face centered atom here, 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 and here. So there are six of those. There are six sides on a cube. Somehow my mind thinks there's four because it's square, but no, it's a cube, right? There are six sides. And if you have a hard time remembering that, think about a dice, right? On a die, how many sides are there? Well, there's six because there's room for six numbers, right? So six. So again, we can use geometry to calculate 
the length of the edge in terms of R. Here, the diagonal along the face is where the atoms touch, and so this is the proof of, of the relationship there. We come up with L is equal to 2 times the square root of 2 times the radius. And again, if you need that on an, on an exam, I'll give that equation to you. We can look at similar um, views of this one. So this is the picture we just looked at. And we can see how many atoms are in this cell. So there's half of an atom here, half there, etc. So we have half of an atom at six faces. So that's a total of three atoms. And then we have at the eight corners an eighth of an atom each. And so that's a total of four atoms, the equivalent of four atoms in this. Here's if we show all of them. And again, this gold atom and the purple atom are the same element. They're just different colors so that we can visualize what's going on here. This one is really hard to look at. Um, here, we're looking at the neighboring atoms that are touching this purple one. The coordination number is 12. I look at that and say, good enough. I don't, I don't need to figure that out. Yeah. I will not ask you to spit back the packing efficiency for these various cells. Um, I could conceivably ask you to calculate the packing efficiency, but I'd give you the edge length equation. So this one is more efficient and has a 74% packing efficiency. Coordination number is 12. So there's a lot of interesting calculations we can do. This one has to do with density. So chromium crystallizes with a body-centered cubic unit cell. The radius of a chromium atom is 125 picometers. Calculate the density of solid crystalline chromium in grams per cubic centimeter. I think one of the trickiest things about this problem is that we were just talking about the face-centered cubic unit cell. And this is saying body-centered. So we tend to want to just use the equation we just looked at. No, and this is the body-centered again. So the length was 4r over the square root of 3. You guys have notes in front of you, is that correct? Yeah. So that's the length of an edge. And so we've got, bless you. We've got the edge length. It's a cube, so we know that the volume is the length cubed. We can express that in terms of the radius um, as 4r over the square root of 3, the quantity cubed. Yes? Uh, are you it of the size or I'm, I'm cubing it because I want the volume of the cube. Oh, okay. Yeah, length times width times height. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, kind of information that we worked out in the previous problem. It's asking us for the density. So what is density? It's the mass divided by the volume. And it's specifically asking for grams per cubic centimeter. So what we need to do is we need to find the mass of this cubic unit cell, and we need to find the volume of the cubic unit cell. Well, we just did a volume calculation, right? So here we have the 125 picometers. We're going to be doing centimeters cubed again. So, um, 125 picometers, I'm going to convert that, uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, and 1 picometer down here, and then over here I'm going to get to centimeters, and 1 times 10 to the minus 2, 
meters, meters cancel out. This is easier than doing it when it's cubed. So 1.25 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So I can plug that into my equation for the volume of the cube. And this should be some crazy small number again. So based on the length or the radius, I, that has three significant figures. So it'll be 2.40, that's the third sig fig. And then I'm gonna put down two extras to avoid rounding errors, because I'm gonna use this number in another calculation. That's the volume. So we've got the mass divided by the volume. So I can stick the volume in here. And now I need to know what is the mass of this cube? Well, inside this cube are how many atoms? Two. Two. Body centered cubic, there's one in the middle and eight eighths, so two atoms. So I need to find the mass of two atoms of chromium. So I have two atoms of chromium. Well, on the periodic table, I can see that one chromium atom weighs uh, 52 atomic mass units. But I need grams. That also gives me the number of grams per mole. But I have atoms. I need to convert atoms to moles using Avogadro's number. So there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole of chromium. So the unit atoms cancels out per mole of chromium. And then from the periodic table, I see it's 52.00 grams per mole of chromium. So two divided by 6.022 EE23 times 52 giving me 172. Um, based on Avogadro's number and the molar mass, this would have four significant figures, because two atoms is exact. That's a counting number. So that's the mass of it in grams. So I can put that in where the mass goes. I'm going to drop those two zeros because they were not um, sig figs and keeping them is not going to affect, keeping them or losing them is not going to affect uh, rounding in any way. So I take that mass and I divide by the volume and I get 7.2. One seven nine zero, which would round to seven point one eight grams <coughs> per cubic centimeter. It's almost 
magical the way we've got these two crazy small numbers and we come up with this like regular number. Now, is that a reasonable density for a metal? What, what sorts of reference do we have? What's the density of water? One gram per cubic centimeter. Are metals more dense or less dense than water? They're more dense. This is not a crazy high number. If we had 7,000, then we'd have an issue. Hey Siri, what's the density of chromium? The density of chromium is about 7.14 grams per cubic centimeter. So Siri says it's 7.18. I'm sorry, 7.14. I came up with 7.18. That is difference in the estimated digit. So we're going to call that good. Any questions? Another way to look at these crystal structures, instead of looking at the individual unit cell, is to think of them in terms of making layers of atoms and how are those layers arranged relative to each other. So you can kind of imagine taking a small box and trying to pack marbles into it, or a larger box and trying to pack balls, right? And so that first layer, you'd put in and you could have them lined up this way so they're all nice and square, right? And then you could make the second layer line up, the, I should start at the bottom. The first layer, everything's nice and square and the second layer, this, these are right on top of each other and the third layer and they're all just stacked up and they're all, all the um, centers line up, okay? If we take that, that we've built by stacking up layers of atoms and look at what's the unit cell here. What is that unit cell called? What's in the middle of it? It'd be a body centered cubic unit cell. No, no it isn't. That's what it looked like it's hard to see. Okay, so this purple one, which kind of looked like it was in the middle, that's the one on the corner. Uh, yeah, simple cubic, which, you know, does, says over there. So simple cubic, <laughs> like, wait a minute. So there's lots of empty space. And if you go home and you try this with, you know, fruit or balls or, or marbles or something, you'll find that it's actually difficult to get them to do this because that second layer wants to fall into the holes created by the first layer. But even just looking at that first layer, we can pack them more efficiently by taking the second row and offsetting it so that we can nestle them a little closer together. That would be in contrast to putting them like this. See how there's more space here, empty space, and there's less space here. So here they're nestling much closer together because this, this row is offset by half an atom compared to that one. Okay, so that's more efficient. So we can do that to the first layer. And then the second layer, now instead of putting it directly above the first layer, Let's let that second layer fall into the little divots, the indentations caused by three of these atoms. And if you play with marbles, this is what's going to happen, right? They're going to fall in like that. Any questions? You got to do some visualizing. And that's a lot harder for some people than for others. So these are called closest packed structures because they're packed closer, right? Um, both of these have uh, packing efficiencies of 74%. So this one where we have 
this A, B, A, B, and, oh, I guess that's what we're illustrating here, where the third layer lines up exactly with the first layer. So this, the red atoms are directly um, lined up. So this is an A, B, A, P, A, B, A, P, mm, A, B, A, B pattern. It shouldn't be that hard to say. The unit cell here is hexagonal. It's not cubic. Okay, it's not cubic. It's called hexagonal closest packed. This, this is the unit cell right here. We see that the angle is not 100, and, it's not 90 degrees. We have 120 and we have 60. So the base here is a diamond. The reason it's called hexagonal closest pack is because if you put several of these together, you get a hexagon. There's also a cubic closest packed. So here's layer A, there's layer A, there's layer B, and then the third layer, instead of this darker ball here being in front so that it lines up with this one, the third layer is offset as well. So we have an ABC, ABC pattern. And this gives us the same unit cell as the face centered cubic. So this one was hexagonal closest packed, and this one is actually a cubic. It's a face centered cubic unit cell. So this is thinking about stacking layers. So here's the first layer. The second layer is offset. The third layer is offset. And then the fourth layer is going to line up with the first one. So if you shove all those together and tip it on the diagonal and cut it up, you get this. That's pretty hard to visualize. Hopefully we can look at this and say, oh yeah, that's a face-centered cubic unit cell. So, yeah, so this is the fourth layer, and this is the fourth layer, the green. So we put it at an angle to cut it up. Um, if you don't mind getting a little messy, what you can do with this is to take some oranges and some toothpicks and pack them together, use the oranges to kind of hold them together, and then take a really sharp knife and start cutting things up. It gets pretty messy, but it can really help you visualize what's going on here. Once you get a clear idea of what this means in your head, then you can just pull that image up and, oh yeah, I see that. Um, you kind of just have to work through it. Some people can just look at the pictures and, oh yeah, I see what that is. Other people need an actual model and they need to actually physically handle it in order to understand. So any questions about those unit cells?